Steve Jew and MMA Mania. Carrington, you're online with Steve Jew and MMA Mania. Hey, Carrington, how are you doing what today? Up? How's it going, sir? Good, how you doing? I'm doing really good, and I'm glad to talk to you about this big fight you've got coming up at Bellator 176, but as they always say, right. you can't talk about the future without knowing your past, and your past was on The Ultimate Fighter, so I want to know, how surprised were you after winning a fight on Season 21 that they didn't keep you around? I wasn't that surprised, man. I was I was, I was, was expecting the best and the worst, really, going into that. I had like a two-year layoff. I was currently 3-0. and and I had only fought once, you know, given that I, like you said, I did win. But in my head, <clears throat> I knew everybody wasn't going to get in the UFC. And at that time, my team was having a lot of success. I was winning. Kamaru Usman, who's killing it in the UFC, he was winning, won the show. Vicente Luque, killing it in the UFC, he was winning. You know, Buscape, Jason Jackson, we had a lot of good guys that were doing really well on the show so I knew that only two people was going so you know there was a chance that I would be and there's a chance I wouldn't be but at the end of the day my that's not gonna you know bring me down or rate you know like my vision is still the same it wasn't gonna change regardless of whether I got in the UFC or not you know and now I'm in a better organization you know I'm much happier where I'm at at the moment so um, it, everything worked out well for me, so I'm not, I, at the moment, I wasn't upset about it, and right now, I still feel good about it. And, of course, you've got to love the fact <laughs> that in Bellator, you're completely unrestricted with sponsors. You can go out there wearing exactly. anything you want, and you can make that money. So much more freedom, you know, just as an athlete, you know, just with sponsorships in your career. Um, and they do their shows a little bit differently, too, you know. Their shows are dope. Like, they're actually entertaining to watch. The way that, you know, they bring the attention and put it on the fighter, um, I think that's really cool. And it, it it brings excitement to the walkout. It brings a lot more excitement and energy, you know, and it's engaging for the fans as well, you know, and the way that they do their shows and they put on their shows. So um, just the show alone being dope, the fact that we can get sponsorships, you know, and the amount of freedom that we have as fighters right now, you know, I really like that. So, like I said, I, I like being with Bellator. I'm, I'm not upset about not getting in the UFC at all. You're definitely <laughs> enjoying the freedom in Bellator, and you're enjoying success there as well. This fight's taking place in Torino, Italy, but you already had the Jet Setter nickname even before flying overseas for this show. How'd that come about? Yeah, really, it was just super random. It was, um, I was a freshman in college. <clears throat> and I used to love this song by Tabby Benet called The Jet Setter. It was a song Jet Setter. I used to play it all the time. And, like, in during wrestling season, it was my shit. So my teammates start calling me The Jet Setter, my wrestling teammates. And uh, from that point on, it just kind of stuck. You know, I was carrying some Jet Setter banks, so I was just a Jet Setter. So after that point, it just never left, you know. I, you know, I'm The Jet Setter. Even though I never left the country or I wasn't traveling like that, but now I see why it was for the future. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it was one of those things that it was destiny it was, to have it was that. foreshadowing. <laughs> right. It was foreshadowing. It's all coming together now and you're going overseas to face exactly. Mihail Nika. So what do you think of Mihail Nika? I'll make it think. I think he's, he, he's undefeated, so you know, like, obviously, he's no slouch. <laughs> um, as far as a fighter, you know, like, when it comes to me, I don't look at the record. I look at the opponent. I'm not fighting his record. So as far as, far as in a fighter, an athlete, um, <clears throat> I think he's an aggressive fighter. He brings it. He mixes it up with his striking well. Um, <clears throat> so that's something that, you know, that I've been paying attention to and being aware of in my camp, you know, just having aggressive people come at me and, you know, learning how to deal with it and work around it. Um, but it's like, I, there's, it's nothing that I've never seen. Um, I train with some of the best fighters in the world, aggressive ones, slick ones, you know, uh, high level strikers. So, um, with my sparring sessions, I feel like it builds my confidence because I do get to see these looks and, um, I just feel like I'm a better all around fighter, whether it is striking or wrestling or grappling. So, um, I really, in my camp, I pay attention, I look at what they do and, you know, the type of energy they bring into the cage, but 
more so I focus on myself and uh, me growing and showing a different side of myself when I step into the cage. So um, really it's been more about me and less about him, but I definitely have done my, my homework and my research and I know what he's bringing. <laughs> Well, you've touched on one of the things that I wanted to, which is that the team that you roll with, the Black Zillions, some of the greatest fighters in the world, and everybody knows their reputation. Do you feel like just the fact that you're on that team gives you the automatic advantage, given that you don't know what kind of training that Mikhail has done, and it may not be on that level? The fact that I don't know what type of training he's done, I can't vouch or speak or, you know, I don't even work my mind up trying to think about it and figure it out, you know, like he might get really good training, you know, or he might, he might not have as good a partners. I mean, more than likely he doesn't have the type of partners that I do have, but who knows? He might be getting really good looks. He might have good training. He might have good coaches. He's five and oh, you know, like, so he's doing something right, you know, but at the end of the day, like I said, I don't work my brain trying to figure out what he's doing or who he's training with. I focus on myself. I focus on how much better I'm getting and uh, the looks that I'm getting from the guys that I train with. Like I said, um, <clears throat> I have the, you know, the great opportunity of training with some of the best in the world. So I get really great looks that makes me confident going into fights or just as a fighter in general. Speaking of things that you probably don't worry about going into a fight, the method of victory probably doesn't matter to you. It wins a win no matter what. But are you also looking for some excitement here in Torino, Italy? Do you want to deliver a knockout? Yeah, man. I want to definitely deliver a finish in this fight. Um, I want to make a statement. <clears throat> like, uh, I, I spoke to some people who interviewed me on my first Bellator fight. And um, I told them it was, you know, like, at that point, I, I was kind of young in my career, really. And um, really, as the fight carry on and each fight, one fight to the next, I said I'm going to continue to get better and every fight's going to be better. They're going to be more exciting and the knockouts and the finishes are going to come. And every fight's gotten better. My stand-up's getting better. I'm getting more confident. I'm getting more comfortable in the octagon. And any fighter... Or any person who's been in a cage knows that that takes time. You know, it's just not something that happens overnight or one or two fights. And um, I'm getting to the point where I'm confident and I'm okay with letting my hands go. I'm okay with staying on my feet. I'm okay with not getting a takedown. I'm okay with being in any position, really. And uh, I think that makes me way more dangerous um, as a fighter. And it's going to open up more finishes for me, me, you know, being more versatile and giving my opponent different looks. So, um, yeah, I do want to, you know, deliver a finish for the fans, but same thing applies. Same principle applies. I don't go in the fight looking for a finish only, you know, I go in there, I fight smart, I fight hard. And, you know, if the finish comes, it comes. And if it doesn't, it's not something that I take lightly. You know, I go back to the drawing board and I figure out ways that I can make adjustments to get finishes and finish fights faster. Because I'd rather be in there for a minute or 30 seconds or two <laughs> minutes rather than 15. Anybody would, you know. So um, that's definitely something that I want to start adding, you know, to my wins is finishes. So obviously then the next <laughs> question would be how's the preparation to make 155 going? How's the weight cutting? It's good. I, um... It's never an issue for me to make weight. Uh, I've cut weight since I was a kid. I've always, I'm a wrestler, so I've been doing this all my life. <clears throat> I know my body, you know, I know how to make weight. I know how to be professional when it comes to these things. So, um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's not easy. Cutting weight's never easy, but that, you know, I know how to, it doesn't affect me mentally or physically because I'm just so used to the process that I just get it done. I knock it out, and I get my mind focused on the fight. So I've been doing this, cutting weight and competing like it feels like forever. And basically, I just bring that mentality over to MMA, and it, it basically is the same except different sport. Have they told you anything about the regulations for the fight in Italy? Will you have to, like, do a weight measurement to make sure your body water ratio rate is right? 
I don't know, to be honest with you. I, I would think I would be fine, though. Um, if he, I saw that he was a former 70 pounder. So if anything, he better hope they're not doing all that because he might have a little trouble. He is a, he's a, he's a 70 pounder usually. So, um, I guess he's fighting at 55 for this one. I hope it's not one of those situations, you know, if it is, it is what it is. But my first fight in Bellator, I fought a dude who came weighing in, you know, 12 pounds over, you know, and, uh, I hope he's a professional about it, and he comes in and he makes weight. That's right, and you were because you still took the fight despite that situation. I, I remember that weighing going, "What hey. the hell?" <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and, and and trust, it is a lot harder to get a finish when a guy weighs about twelve, fifteen pounds more than you. You know, and he doesn't have to go through the weight cut process. So, um, not not making any excuses. I felt like I dominated that fight, but. Still, you know, it wasn't an even playing field when it came to, you know, he didn't make weight. But it was okay, though, because I was prepared and I was ready to fight. And I wasn't, if he would have been 20 pounds over, I probably still would have took the fight because, you know, I was looking forward to fighting in Bellator and putting, you know, getting that debut. Well, plus you probably got 20% of his purse for missing weight. So at the end of the day, he missed weight, you got paid, and you look good. And Big John McCarthy raised your hand at the end. Yeah, I I had John the last two fights. I like having John. He ain't no, you know, he's good. I know he's he's one of he's the best man. So it's always nice to know that you got the best referee in your corner, or you know, not in your corner, but in the cage, because everything's gonna be judged correctly. You know, I like that. So and just to say that I was, you know, he refed my fight, or he, you know, refed my fight is cool in itself. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully Extra they're flying him into Torino so we can make it three in a row. Right? For real, though. For <laughs> real. We'll see. All right. Well, Carrington, I know you got a lot of interviews coming up today, so I want to give you this opportunity to plug anything you want, sponsors, social media, before I let you go and you get on to the next one. All right. Well, I mean, if I'm a plug, I'm plugging Mob Inc. They do my, my homie Danny over in uh, Boca Raton, hooks it up. He's, very, he's awesome. Plugging the new vegan over in Delray. Obviously, I'm vegetarian, so I'm always rocking with the meat-free, cruelty-free movement. And, uh, yeah, but Black Zillion, um, and that's about it. All right. Well, you may be cruelty-free in your diet, but you're not going to be cruelty-free when it comes to my meat game, am I right? You, you already know, duality. You know, you got to have both sides. 